that. One of the things that we were studying this week, and I'll go ahead and invite you to turn in your Bibles again to Mark 2. Mark chapter 2 is where we're going to be today, starting in verse 13 through 17. Again, that's Mark 2, verses 13 through 17. And if you don't have your Bibles with you, there is either one up by your knee in the back of the pew in front of you, or you can get the scriptures out of the uh, sermon bulletin. So I invite you to follow along with us. As I was studying these scriptures, one of the things that really uh, just kind of impressed upon me, and one of the things that, that uh, the Lord was really reminding me of, was actually a time in a previous church I had. You see, I've been working as a youth minister in this church, and we had seen God do some amazing things. I'll tell you this. Uh, one of the really cool things that happened in this church uh, that we were doing is, uh, again, I was a youth minister, and uh, these youth, they didn't really have anything to do on Wednesday nights. They didn't really have a Wednesday night study or anything like that. And so uh, one of the things that I really desired to do was is to get these youth involved on Wednesday nights to come up for Bible study, a lot like what we do here every Wednesday night. But these kids, again, they didn't have that type of deal. Well, as the ministry got started, I will tell you, when you start a ministry sometimes, um, it's kind of hard to be able to do that. And what I mean by that is, is that you're starting from scratch. You get maybe one or two people, and they'll, they'll be there for a couple weeks. And then you'll start getting three or four people, and then they'll be there for a couple weeks. And then you'll maybe jump up to six or eight, and then you'll be there for a couple weeks. And it's not for a little bit of time until that ministry really starts to take off. Because once you get to about 10 to 12 students, uh, or individuals within that ministry, it doesn't really blossom. But once you get that 10 or 12 mark, man, I'll tell you what, it shoots up, you're at 25, 35, 45, real fast. Um, almost in the blink of an eye. And I'll tell you this, um, the hardest part of that ministry is at the very beginning part of it. But I will also tell you this, even though that's the hardest part, sometimes that's the most impactful part. What I mean by this is simply whenever we are whenever we are looking at ministries and we are looking at studying God's Word and we are looking at serving the people around us, sometimes serving the very small the smallest number you have, the number you have, the more impactful that it will be. I'll tell you this, one time in that in on those Wednesday nights, we had a grand total of six students on Wednesday night. Woo! Yeah, six students. We're going, man, we are really throwing a party here, right? We had six students, but we didn't get discouraged. We didn't get worried about it or anything like that. We, we did our normal routine where we stood up and we sang some songs and we, we prayed to God for Him to be with us in that service and, and we started studying God's Word and something amazing happened. You see, in that one night whenever we were starting a Wednesday night, we only had six students there. When we thought God wasn't going to do anything, God showed up in a big, big way. And after studying those scriptures and after diving into what God would really have for us on that night, we had four of those students accept Christ. I mean, how cool is that? Four of six. That's a pretty good percentage. <laughs> you know, what I'm telling you here is, is sometimes we get caught up looking at numbers. Sometimes we get caught up looking at it and, and making judgments on things before we really understand what God's hand is in that situation. You know, sometimes I wonder if we think about that within our church. I mean, let, let's be honest here. Let's, let's look at some of the ministries that we have within our church. Are we expecting God to show up in a really big way? That's a question we should ask ourselves. I mean, even within the service this morning, do we get up this morning and drive to church this morning expecting to God to, to do something really big in our lives? Can you honestly say yes? That was the case for you. That's a question we all must be asking ourselves because the reality is, is that when, when God comes into our lives or when God speaks to us through His Word, He's desiring something for us. Y'all realize that, right? Absolutely. And so when we come to God's Word, we should be expecting God to show up in a mighty way. The other part of that is that we have to be expecting God to do things in our lives whenever we're serving in other areas. Do y'all realize that? Like whenever you go out into the community, whenever you go and share the gospel with your neighbor, whenever you read your Bible at home, whenever you go to Mission Knoxville, you need to be expecting God to do certain things within our lives. And I wonder how many of us in, in this room would be sitting there going, you know, I'm expecting God to do something through my efforts. 
How would that change our efforts? Would we, would we view our efforts in a different way if we understood that God was doing something big through them? I believe it would. I believe in this room, if I asked, a, and we could just take a poll right now, let me ask you this, church, by a raise of hands here. If we saw 100 people come to faith in Christ at Mission Knoxville, would we send more people? Would you raise your hand if you would? Yeah. Okay. Let me ask you this. If we sent 50, would we send more people? If we saw 50 people to come to Christ, absolutely we would. We'd send a whole lot more people. Okay. What about 25? Absolutely. You can raise your hand again. What about 10? Absolutely. What about one? Absolutely. Right? So why are we expecting these things from God? It doesn't make sense. It should change our perspective in this. It should change our understanding of this. And you know, I think that's very key when studying this text that we're going to look at here today because Jesus is going to address some expectations of ours and some expectations of the Pharisees, which are completely false. And I believe, and I'm proposing to you today, that we need to examine our own hearts whenever we look at these texts because I find that a lot of times we place our own expectations and judgments on God before He even acts. So let's do this. Let's look and read through the verses. And uh, I'll try and break these down for you. Look at verse 13. He says this. He, he went out again beside the sea, and all the crowds was coming to him, and he was teaching them. And he passed by, and he saw Levi, the son of Alphaeus, sitting at the tax booth, and he said to him, Follow me. And he rose and followed him. And as he reclined at the table in his house, many tax collectors and sinners were reclining with Jesus and his disciples, for there were many who followed him. And the scribes of Pharisees, when they saw that he was eating with sinners, and tax collectors said to the disciples, Why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? And when Jesus heard it, he said to them, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I came not to call the righteous, but the sinners. You see, put yourself in this position for just one moment. You're sitting out in the heat of the day. It is hot. I mean, flat out hot. You're in the middle of the desert. You can picture it a lot like what we're dealing with here. It's pretty hot. But not only are you sitting out in the middle of the desert, you actually are sitting in a booth. So there is no wind blowing or anything like that. You're sweating. Just sweat profusely coming off of you. And you're looking out and you're seeing all the people and you're trying to reconcile in your mind who has paid their taxes and who has not paid their taxes. And you're waiting for certain people to come along and when they come along they may give you a few coins and things like that which you tally on your little notebook and and you pass them on and tell them they were good for a certain period of time. And other people, they would come along and you know they would need to pay their taxes. And you would say, hey, you need to pay your taxes. And you would tell them, you have until this date to pay your taxes. As they were passing by, you'd see the judgmental glares from them. Because these people didn't like you. Nobody likes the person that always comes after them when it comes to money, right? You would see these judgmental glares as if whenever you called their name, you called them out by name, their countenance changed from a smile to, to the evil eye. You would see this. Then something happens on the horizon. As you're looking off on the horizon, you see a mob of people. It may even cross your mind for just a moment that they're coming after you. After all, you're not Mr. Popular in the community. But then you spot it as they get closer. Jesus... The man you've only heard of walking with his disciples comes upon you. He comes closer to you. And as they get closer, man, the crowd is a buzz, man. They are, they are talking and they are clapping and they are singing and they are, they are doing all sorts of things to make all sorts of noises. And you just hear this roar from this crowd and it's unmistakable. You see, Jesus has just come back from his teaching. And you can only speculate what these guys heard. You can only speculate what they understood. But it had to be good from the roar of the crowds. And as they get closer to you, all of a sudden you see Jesus kind of look at you from the corner of your eye, and your eyes lock. He looks at you more intently, and you're going, man, what is this? What is up with this guy? As he gets closer and closer, he just kind of stares at you a little bit. And before you know it, he doesn't call you by name. He doesn't do any of that type of deal. He just looks at you and says, follow me. Follow me. You feel this welling up within your heart. You feel this welling up within your emotion and in your desires, and you can't explain it. 
you're not even really sure that you're understanding it. All that you know is that you're called to leave everything in your booth and just follow. No matter what it is. And it's amazing to me whenever we look at this and we see this within Matthew, who is accounted to as Levi in this passage here. It's amazing to me we see this because, I don't know about you, but if I was sitting within that booth and I saw this strange man walk out with me and just call me to follow him, I'm not sure I'd just go. But Matthew did. The other thing about this is that we have to understand is Jesus must have known that Matthew wasn't, or Levi wasn't, Mr. Popular. After all, Levi was what we call a sinner. You see, the interesting thing about this passage is, Matthew, or is Jesus did not call Levi to get out of the booth first. He didn't tell him to stop being a tax collector first. He called him out of that booth as he was, as a sinner. Now many of you may be going, what is a sinner? What, what are you talking about here, Pastor? Where are we going with this? I'm not really sure that I understand. And what I'm saying in this is that Matthew was a normal guy. Matthew was a normal guy doing a job that nobody liked. But because he was doing this job in a way that would inhibit Israel, would inhibit God's people, he was sinning against God. He was leveraging his power against the people and taking advantage of people, breaking several of the commandments by doing this. You see, the thing we have to understand here is that Matthew's life, it parallels a lot with our lives. Y'all understand that? Y'all see that? Because what I mean by this is that there are many of us in this room that have broken God's law. And that's, that's kind of what it means. We have broken God's law, and that's what it means to be a sinner. I mean, the Bible even records this throughout the Scriptures, where it says, you know, that we are fallen short of the glory of God. No one seeks after God. No, not one. No, there is no one who is righteous. Those are all out of Romans 3. And when we understand this, we understand that our sin separates us from God, Correct? And when we're separated from God, we have no way to come back to God. Just like Matthew, Matthew was stuck in a booth, in a place that he was not comfortable in, with no real answers on where to go. And a lot of us feel that way because of our sin. You see, a lot of us may feel that way because of the things that we do in our lives. We may get trapped in our lives because of our own action. This may be dealing with an addiction. This may be dealing with an adulterous relationship, a relationship that's outside of marriage. This may be dealing with an unhealthy friendship because it's covered in lies and jealousy and greed. You see, our sin, it taints our relationship, it taints our lives, it makes them dirty before God, and that's what separates us from God. But the cool thing is, is just like Matthew, he didn't clean up his life before he started following Jesus. God looked on him, Jesus looked on him and said, follow me, and he did that for each one of us. Y'all have to understand that within this text. And what this is ultimately doing is showing us a view of what God has done for us. And because God saw us as sinners in need of a Savior, people who do wrong things in need of reconciliation with God, He sent Jesus to come to the earth to fulfill prophecy, to die on the cross for our sins, to be buried for three days, and raised again three days later. Amen? Amen. Amen. He absolutely did this. And, and it's interesting in this because you just see a small glimpse of God's love through this, don't you? I mean, in the simple way that, that Jesus just passed by Matthew and saw him as he is where he sits and goes, follow me. You're not worthy of it. You're not good enough for it. You're not popular. You're not smart. You're none of those things to even equal God. But what you can do is you can follow me. I want you to be with me. And that's exactly what God does for us. By showing us His love. And you know the closest thing I can do to be able to really draw this out for you is tell you a story about my own life. I'll tell you a story about this and I'm going to incriminate myself a little bit here. Um, for those of you who have known me for a little while, uh, I grew up in a household that, uh, that it was awesome. My, my parents made a good amount of money and I raced motorcycles when I was a teenager. And it was, like I said, awesome. Uh, I had a lot of really cool things and stuff like that, but part of the thing with racing motorcycles is you don't always race at the same track. You race all over the state of Texas, all over the state of Oklahoma, Louisiana. I went all over the place to be able to do this because you race in series and you rack up points and all that type of thing. And so once I did this, um, I did this for two or three years before the time I was 16, so I started about 12 or 13. And I started doing this, and I can just tell you right now, my mother loved hauling me around all these states every weekend to go race motorcycles and spend the entire weekend out in the heat. I'm being sarcastic. 
No, I'm sure, sure she had her, her times in this. And I, I love my mother because she was very sacrificial in that. But by the time I turned 16, I can just imagine in her head, there was a little bit of a, yes, he can drive himself. Right? There was a little bit of that in her mind. And, and so much to the fact that whenever I got my first car, I got my first car a little bit early. And I got a 98 Dodge Ram. Ooh, buddy. It was awesome. Awesome. And now the reason why I'm telling you this is because it was decked out brand new. My parents went out and got it for me. It had an extended cab, which they didn't have double cabs back then. It had an extended cab. So it was the biggest one you could get. Not only that, it had an 8-foot truck bed for my dirt bikes. I was set, man. I was good to go. Where we're going, I don't care. If it's Florida or California or Washington or anywhere else, I didn't care. We're going. I got my truck, we're good to go. But you know what I quickly learned was, is that for a 16-year-old to drive an 8-foot truck bed and probably a 19-foot long truck was probably a dangerous proposition. Amen. I got a few amens from that, right? I'll tell you this, over the next uh, 16 to 18 months, I think I got a total of nine wrecks. I was backing into things left and right. That was a dangerous area to be. I needed one of those little buzzers that beeps, beeps, beeps when you back up, right? That's exactly what I needed. And I, I did all these things, and man, I can just tell you, that was a hard time in my life. I felt so bad for uh, about doing it. And my parents, um, every time I knew... I knew I was in trouble after I backed into somebody's car because I knew I was going to catch up with my parents. And man, I'll, I'll tell you this, after the eighth or the ninth time of uh, going to my parents and my dad was like, oh great, here you go. It's almost like he picked up the phone and he goes, Who's you hit, who, who did you hit now? And, uh, and I just knew it was coming. And, but there was a conversation that happened that ninth time after, uh, after I kept messing up and kept doing wrong and kept backing into people this brand new truck that got later that my father had given me. Um, after a conversation, telling him and confessing these things to him, um, he got a little bit angry with me. I'll be honest with you there. I deserved it. But one of the things that stuck with me after that conversation was, is he, he looked at me and he goes, you know, I realize that you get in a lot of wrecks and I realize you do a lot of wrong, but I need you to understand something, that you're still my child. And I still love you no matter what. And I think that's something that we can take out of this passage here. Is because we are all understand in this room that we've all wronged God in some way. We've all messed up in some account. We've all, we've all, I guess you could say, wrecked the truck. But our Heavenly Father loves us more than anything. He still calls each and every one of us to follow Him. And I want you to see something else about this. Look in this passage one more time. I want you to underline it. Look at Matthew's response. And it says, and he rose and he followed him. You see, what happened here is Jesus says, follow me. He, he's not saying please. He's not saying will you. He says, follow me. He's given Matt, Matthew the command to do this. And Matthew, what he does is he basically lets go of everything he has. He drops what he's doing and he gets out of the booth and he starts following Christ. So he lets go and follows Christ. Now, I want you to see something in here and something that the Bible does not record and we need to read through the lines in order to do this is that there is no crisis of conscience once Matthew does this. What I want you to see in this is that Matthew never sits there and goes, Jesus told me to follow him. Am I good enough to follow him? He never goes to Jesus and goes, whoa, Jesus, hold on just one second. I'm not sure that I'm good enough of a person to follow you. I'm not sure I'm clean enough as a person to follow you. I'm sh not sure I am sinless enough of a person to be able to follow you. You see what is going on in here? Is he saying, look, I'm just going to follow you as I am now. And the reason why I bring this up in here is because there may be many of you sitting in that pew today going, you know, God, I'm not really good enough to do your work. I'm not really good enough to be in a relationship where I follow you. I'm not really good enough to be able to hang out with those church people. I'm not really good enough to serve in that way. I'm not really good enough in order to be your disciple. I'm not really good enough to be an effective church member. I'm not good enough. But here's what I'm proposing to you. If that's you sitting in these pews today and you're saying that, look, I am not good enough to do this, what I'm telling you is, is that you're absolutely right. You're not. Amen. But the reality is, is that none of us are. Amen. 
And what we're essentially doing when we do that is we are grabbing on to our past sins and we're holding those in a fist. We're sitting there saying, God, look, I would rather hold on to my sin. I would rather hold on to my pride than lay it down before you. I would rather hold on to these things than let go. Do you understand that? I want to ask you guys, what is holding you back from following Jesus? I mean, honestly, ask yourself, what is holding you back to following Jesus? Are you the one sitting in that pew today holding on to that sin? Are you holding on to that past failure? And saying, Jesus, look, I'm not good enough to follow you. Or are you holding on to your weakness and saying, I'm not good enough to serve you? What are you holding on to, church? What do you need to let go of to follow Jesus? You see, the thing is, is that Jesus calls us no matter what we're holding on to. Do you understand that? We're all called to follow Him. Let's go on to the next section here because I want you to see this as well because we have this change of events within the next section of Scripture. What we have here is we have a switch of scenery. And you'll notice it jumps very quickly from verse 14 to verse 15. And you'll see in verse 15 that immediately the scene changes to Jesus and the disciples reclining at the table in a house. And they're reclining with many tax collectors and sinners who were reclining with Jesus and his disciples, for there were many who followed him. You see, what he's saying here is he's saying many of those people that Jesus calls out, they actually followed him just like Matthew. There were many people following him, eating with him, and reclining at the table with him. But then you have those people that are standing on the outside, verse 16, and the scribes and the Pharisees, when they saw that he was eating with sinners and tax collectors, they said to his disciples, why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? You can almost picture it in your mind, right? I mean, you can almost understand it with, within your psyche. You can almost draw the picture as if you're watching a movie. You see Jesus and all his disciples sitting around a table. They're reclining. They're at the house and everything else. And then you have the pastors by. What are they doing? They're giving them the evil eye, right? They're giving them the stink eye. They're just following along and just kind of going, what are, what are these guys doing? What are they doing? They're being judgmental. You see, what was happening in this time is that God was doing something very, very big in the lives of these people, but they were judging it based on their own perception and understanding. You know, before we even move from this, I need to point out that there are three assumptions that these guys are making, three assumptions that I want you to write down that we must be very careful of. There are three assumptions that the Pharisees are making in this by being judgmental in this. And the first one is simply this, and you're going to find this one maybe even a little bit comical. The first one is that God doesn't know what He's doing. Right? Because we all know that Jesus is actually God's Son. He is God Himself. Jesus is recorded saying in John 14 that I and the Father are one. Jesus was very aware of what He was doing. After all, He was the one who called Matthew to follow him. He was the one who called these people to follow him. He was the one who brought these people out and challenged them to follow him, just like he does you and I. And the thing is, is that, is that when these people looked upon Jesus and they said, and what is he doing? Why does he eat with tax collectors or sinners? They're basically saying, that guy, he doesn't know what he's doing, therefore God does not know what he's doing. And so what I want to be able to bring out from this, and what I want to just kind of bring up to this, is the, the assumption that we often make. And the assumption that we often make is simply this, is that, is that a lot of times we do this. I mean, when we look on people that we don't know, and we make assumptions about them, we look on friends and family, who don't necessarily act the way that they should. And we make assumptions on them because that's, after all, what the Pharisees are doing within this passage, isn't it? I mean, they're looking on these people who don't know God and expecting them to act in godly ways. How can we expect sinners to act like saved people? It doesn't make sense. And how can we not expect God to go after them? How can we not expect godly people to go after them? You see, hear what I'm telling you, people. 
Here's what I'm telling you, church, is that oftentimes we don't see God moving. We don't understand what God is doing because we think we're more righteous than other people. And we're not willing to go out and serve them. We should be modeling what Jesus did here. Don't you think? We should be modeling what Jesus did as going after those who needed His help. Look at the next part about this too. The, third, the next assumption is this. Write this down. It says God's first priority is His cleanliness. God's first priority is His cleanliness. And here's what I mean by this, is that these Pharisees at a certain point in time, they were, they were more concerned with what it took to be clean before God's eyes than what it took to reach God's people. And I'm going to propose this to you today, is that many of us are in this boat. Sure, you may not be judging those people around us. You, you may be able to wash your hands of that and go, look, I'm not going to, to judge anybody about it, but you know what, I'm really just not going to even engage them either. I'm going to keep my hands clean. I don't have to deal with those and so I can just avoid them. That sounds like a good plan. You see, the thing is, is that whenever we take this type of theology, whenever we take this type of view, basically what we're doing is we're sitting there saying that God doesn't care about us. And we have an incorrect theology, an incorrect view of who God is and what He does care about. And what I mean by this is that simply this is that God cares more about you than He ever did His cleanliness. Amen. And what I mean by that is, is found in the Scriptures. You can look in Isaiah 64, 6. Isaiah 64, 6, where Isaiah speaks prophecy about God. And he says this. He says, look, our most righteous actions are nothing but filthy rags before Him. You see, what I'm telling you here is that whenever we... Don't engage people in order to keep ourselves clean spiritually or free of drama or free of things that we don't want to associate with. What we're saying is we're saying we're more righteous than that. But when the Scripture looks at it and the Scripture says this and the Scripture explains that our best actions are nothing but filthy rags before God, we're just discrediting those verses. So what should we do? We should be more concerned with people than we are with, with, the, uh, with worrying about getting our hands dirty. The third assumption is this. Let me give you the third assumption. The third assumption is this, is that God doesn't love us. You see, the thing is, is that these Pharisees and their, these, these scribes that were walking by and looking at Jesus and all his, and his disciples and all this, and the people who were following him, they were making a, a very difficult assumption. And that assumption was is that God doesn't love them. Y'all understand that? They were saying, look, these guys are tax collectors and sinners. God doesn't love them. He doesn't care about them. Therefore, I should not love them. And I should not care about them. When the reality is, is what did Jesus do? Jesus went to them. Jesus cared for them. Jesus loved them. Jesus served them. And guys, here's the good news about this. And here's the encouragement from this. Is that no matter where you are in this, if you are a scribe, if you are a Pharisee, if you are a sinner, if you are a tax collector, if you are falling before God or trying to be righteous before God, no matter where you are within this plane, God loves you and cares for you. God wants you to come to Him. God wants you to be with Him. But here's the fallacy of the Pharisees. Here's where the assumptions all meet. You see, unlike the guy at the beginning, unlike Levi at the beginning who was maybe even holding on to his sin in order to not follow God, these Pharisees, what are they doing? They're holding on to their own righteousness, their own pride. That's what they're doing. They're saying, look, I don't need Jesus. I'm a good person. I don't need to come to God. I don't need to follow God. I'll just do my religious duty. And I'll be okay. I don't need to engage the world around me. I don't need to engage the people outside of the church. Because I am the church. Guys, let me ask you this. Are you holding on to that pride? 
Are you holding on to your self-righteousness? Are you ready to let it go? And let God lead you? Because here's the thing too, is that Jesus not only called the sinners to follow Him, He's also called the righteous to follow Him. These guys obviously weren't following Him. When we hold on to our pride that way, we don't let it go. We're not following Jesus. We're following ourselves. We're not being Christians. Let me give you the third thing about this. And this is found in verse 17. And in verse 17 it says, And when Jesus heard it, He said to them, You know, it's funny because these, uh, these prideful uh, Pharisees and scribes, they're saying things about Jesus and who Jesus is, and, and they're making judgments upon Him as if Jesus didn't know what they were doing. And that's funny too, because the reason why that's funny is because there are many of us within this church, many of us sitting here in these pews right now that are saying things in our mind and going, you know, I'm not prideful and I'm not a sinner. I'm in neither one of these camps and I'm not following Jesus either. I'm just kind of the third party here and I'm assuming that God doesn't understand that. The reality is, is that each and every, was, each and every one of us must understand that Jesus knows exactly where you are now, just like he did these guys. He knows where you're sitting. He knows what you're holding on to. You're not in secret. You're not hiding. There is no hiding before God. God knows all of us. He knows all of our hearts. And so when Jesus heard it, He said to them, and He lays the bombshell out for them. He gives them the explanation of His ministry here. He says, those who are well who have no need of a physician, but those who are sick, I came not to call the righteous, but the sinner. You see, what Jesus is saying here is He's saying, look, I, I, I did not come to those who are just holding on to whatever it is in their life that they're unwilling to let go of. I came to those who are ready to let go and let God. <laughs> let me ask the church, are you ready to let go and let God? Are you ready to follow Him? Because that's the question we must be asking ourselves. We must ask ourselves, are we ready to follow Him? Are we ready to let go of whatever that thing is? I know there are many of you in this room and sitting there going, well, wait a minute, I, told, I, thought, I thought in order for me to be able to follow Christ, I had to be a good person. Or I had to be being more and more and more obedient in order to be a good person, in order to follow Jesus. Well, you're right. I'm not telling you that obedience doesn't matter in following Jesus. But obedience begins first whenever we let go. You see, the reason is, and the thing is about this whole deal, is that only when we let go of what we desire can we follow God in a real way. 